Hey everybody, welcome back to the Vertical Diet Podcast. This week and every week hereafter, as often as we can, we're going to do a Q&A. We wanted to answer your questions. I've probably received, and we've probably received, since launching the Vertical Diet, over 50,000 comments, DMs, emails, texts uh, with questions. And we try to answer just about as many as we can. Those of you who have sent me messages, uh, the vast majority have received replies. Oftentimes, I'll, you know, sometimes it's just a yes or no, and sometimes I'll attach an article, uh, but we still get lots and lots of questions, and some of them are the same question. So what we did this week is I just compiled all the questions that came in, and we sorted them by the most abundant, uh, and we came up with three that uh, uh, generally we receive over and over again, so we wanted to talk about them one more time. Why don't you start by launching kind of the most common question we get. Yeah, one of the most common questions we get is regarding blood pressure. Um, basically, you know, ways to, to manage that, to keep it in an appropriate range. Um, and so we have our high blood pressure quick fix kit in, in the diet, in the download. Um, so we're going to go through some of the big rocks in here and, and kind of discuss uh, the, the big takeaways of things that anybody can do and, and implement. So I probably should mention that you're getting actual uh, Nutritional advice from a registered <laughs> dietitian who's a PhD in exercise phys. So this isn't just Stan winging it over here. Uh, we've taken a lot of time to look into these and look at what the, uh, I think, the most important things, factors are. And we'll kind of discuss those as we go. So why don't you launch? Yeah. So first thing that anybody can do that's immediately implementable is going to be taking your 10-minute walks. So we recommend take at least three 10-minute walks you know, right after a meal. Um, this is going to do a couple things for you in terms of your, your blood pressure. Um as you do this over time, your your blood vessels are going to respond to this positively. And so over the course of the, the, the day, you're going to have a, a lower uh, blood pressure. So um, when you're looking at your blood pressure, what we're trying to achieve, we should probably talk about what is normal. Normal is less than 120 over 80. Um, and so the top number is your systolic number, and that is the amount of pressure on your blood vessels when your heart is actually contracted. The bottom number is your diastolic, and that's going to be the most important number because that's the constant pressure on those blood vessels when your heart is actually considered at rest. Um, One of the biggest recommendations we can make in terms of the priority items, if you're going to if you're going to set them up in terms of action items, is to lose weight. Generally speaking, yeah. if you lose a pound, you're going to take one. A millimeter of systolic blood pressure off of your reading. So if you drop 20 pounds, that's 20. So if you've got a 140 over 80, it's going to go down to 120 over 70. I don't think it's as directly relative to right. the diastolic, but for the systolic in particular, you're going to lose that just from the weight loss itself. And you're going to see positive health benefits, you know, within the first up to 10% amount of weight loss. So, you know, if you're 200 pounds, that first 20 pounds is, is important. And you'll see the, the health benefits even before you hit that number 20. So don't think that you got to lose a, a drastic amount of weight to start seeing benefits. The second you start losing weight and implementing that stuff, you're actually going to start to notice a difference in your health. Yeah, we've noticed uh, even a, as little a change as say 7% of your body weight, and we'll talk about this again when we talk about blood sugars, mm -hmm. is that, uh, that that's significant. That can take you from unhealthy to healthy. So a 300 pound person might only have to lose about 20 to 25 pounds and still realize a significant benefit in blood pressure and all the other health markers. And they'll probably even see it before that 20 or 25 pounds. Yep. So that's that's the goal is, is just start somewhere. So uh, third is going to be improved sleep. You know, we, we talk about this all the time. And there's probably nothing we talk about more <laughs> is, is, is improving sleep. It's probably the number one uh, performance enhancing thing on earth and it's free. Um, it's not just the amount of sleep, it's the quality of it, sleep. It's particularly important for people with apnea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to talk about salt in a minute, but if you want to make a comparison between, uh, you know, hypertensive people who eat too much salt and people who have sleep apnea, uh, salt might raise blood pressure in a small percentage of the population by two to seven millimeters, whereas sleep apnea can raise it by up to 20 millimeters. It's one of the most significant things that I've realized with clients, especially my heavier clients, the football players, the powerlifters, the strongmen. When I can get them on a CPAP, their blood pressure will come down 15 to 20 points in a very short period of time. Yeah, and, and the, one of the reasons that it was believed that that's what happens is that if you're not getting adequate sleep, and we're talking like quality sleep, you can't just be laying in bed and playing on your phone and watching TV or whatever. It's, it's actual like true sleep is, you know, the more deep sleep you get and the more full circadian rhythms you get um, or sleep cycles you get, the, the better your neurological system is going to recover. So that's going to send the, the appropriate signals to the body to kind of bring down any of that blood pressure or any of that you know, systemic stress. I know that's a terrible word to use because you can't really quantify it, but that's essentially one of the things that is thought to be going on. 
So the next one on the list is iodine in so much as it helps improve thyroid function. That's why we recommend iodine in the diet. Your thyroid function can have a significant impact on blood pressure as well. We've seen studies in women, hypothyroid, low thyroid women versus normal thyroid women, and there can be up to a 20-point systolic blood pressure difference between the two groups. So that can be significant. Some people may choose to go in and get a blood test and look at their, their uh, thyroid markers, which should, should consist of four readings. It's going to be your TSH, your free T4, free T3, and your reverse thyroid. And if you're low thyroid, you may very well have uh, high blood pressure as a result. And if you remedy that problem, whether it be through medication or through improved sleep, exercise, and iodine intake, which the lifestyle factors can improve that just by themselves without the need of, of thyroid medication, then you'll see a significant improvement, not just in your energy levels, but in your blood pressure as well. Yeah, and that's uh, secondarily, your thyroid will also play a role in your vitamin D status. You need your parathyroid hormone to actually activate your vitamin D in the kidney. Uh, so if you don't have healthy thyroid function, that could limit your ability, even if you're taking in vitamin D supplements to actually convert it to a usable form. And that was one of the, the things on our list with the high blood pressure uh, quick fix kit was vitamin D as well. Mm -hmm. and so maybe you have to get a vitamin D25 hydroxy test in your blood test to see if you're low, in which case you'd want to remedy that. We kind of have a blanket recommendation because yeah. so many people are deficient mm -hmm. and it's so hard to get from diet. We've put out about 4,000 IUs. I've talked as much and a lot of, of good reputable mm -hmm. uh, recommendations have made, has suggested as much as 8,000. Um, I, I think that we're pretty safe by saying 4,000 I use for most people. Uh, if you're in, especially if you're in a, a northern climate where it's dark a lot or if you have dark skin, uh, you're going to need vitamin D. And you should take that with foods that are containing fat. It's a fat-soluble vitamin, so you, in order to absorb it really well, you want to take that with fat-soluble foods. Yeah. Um, and I think something that we, you know, everybody talks about with, with blood pressure is going to be sodium. Um, I guess the point we want to make is that sodium is not the only component of blood pressure and determining the level of, of pressure that, that you're going to find in, in the blood. Um, so we recommend people are getting their 4,700 milligrams of potassium as well as making sure you're getting an adequate amount of magnesium a day and calcium. So the point there is that all of these things are electrolytes. And so they're going to balance fluid in the blood, and that will change blood volume. And so blood pressure is really highly related to blood volume. Um, so sodium isn't the only thing, I guess, the, the bottom line there. So um, when they ran the NHANES data, the National Health and uh, Nutritional Examination Survey, this is the largest epidemiological study ever done looking at health. Uh, they've analyzed sodium and hypertension for all three analysis and all of them, they couldn't find a relationship between sodium and hypertension, which is counter, <laughs> counter to what you've been told, you know, from everybody else. So yeah. um, if you're sensitive to sodium, it could be an issue, right? But if you're not, then it, you, the other things are going to play a balance and, and keep everything together. So yeah. there is a small percentage of the population who is hypertensive. They do respond to sodium with an increased blood pressure. Uh, most of the population does not, however. That small percentage of the population that's hypertensive, even when they consume sodium, excess sodium, probably more than six or seven grams a day of sodium, which is about 15 grams of salt, uh, those folks will experience an elevation of two to seven millimeters in increased systolic blood pressure. So you can see in comparison to sleeping and in comparison to uh, adequate thyroid function, it's, it's, it's much less significant. That same group, when they were given adequate potassium, we recommend 4,700 milligrams a day, and particularly from diet, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, that effect went away. They were normalized. So uh, we're, we're not fear-mongering about sodium. We don't think it's the first thing that you should be concerned about. Uh, matter of fact, quite the contrary. We think it's important for your, your, um, uh, your recovery and your performance and your energy levels. And uh, if you've got a, a relative uh, or yourself, you get up from a seated position and you're lightheaded, that's usually a sodium deficiency. So... We don't demonize salt. Uh, we just prioritize all these other methods, which we think are far more important in terms of regulating blood pressure. And we should probably make a quick disclaimer that, you know, this is for the generally healthy adults yeah. um, in the population. If you've got somebody who's got issues with their kidneys or their renal compromise, obviously these recommendations are going to change. Um, but if yeah. you've got somebody who's in general health, generally healthy, then, then that's where we're going with this. So Correct. Uh, I did mention that uh, getting the potassium from food I think one of the important things there is potassium supplements can be hard on digestion yeah. and the lining of the stomach. And so we don't recommend popping potassium pills. We've got a, uh, actually a list in the vertical diet. We have a, a potassium intake that we recommend and show all the foods and what their potassium content is so you can get adequate potassium from diet. Yeah. 
Um, so I think that pretty much takes care of uh, blood pressure. Um, the second one is probably going to be blood sugar, um, which if you have uncontrolled blood sugar can also play a role in your blood yes, pressure. Yeah. But <laughs> You know, and let's start by talking about how do you identify blood sugars. Uh, obviously, if, if uh, you know, if you are really tired after a meal with carbohydrates, that might be indicative that you have some problem with your insulin sensitivity. We do recommend a blood test, yeah. you know, particularly mm -hmm. for athletes or people who, uh, who suspect uh, that they're, they have some high blood sugars because we think that insulin and blood sugars uh, probably is, is the most uh, significant causal agent of cardiovascular disease and, and a host yeah. of other, you know, obesity, fatty liver. So there's three things, maybe four, that you want to look at. Oftentimes when you go in to get a test, you, the doctor will run your fasted glucose and he'll run possibly your HA1C. Those are really common Unfortunately, those things can stay normal for quite some time, years maybe, while your insulin levels are slowly elevating, which is a much better indicator, a much better uh, a way to determine you know, ahead, of the, ahead of the fact that, uh, that you've got some problems with blood sugar. And so look, get your insulin levels in that blood test. Now the insulin levels, I think the average is what, two to 24 they show in there is the normal Somewhere, range. Somewhere, yeah, real close Somewhere to in that range, two to 24, it's a huge range. Uh, anything over six, I'm suspicious they're starting to become a problem. You'll also see this in your triglycerides. You'll uh, yeah. start to see that, that the, the amount of sugars in your liver is going to create higher tri triglycerides. And so both of those things. Can, and the insulin can be the causal agent of high triglycerides. And the doctor might tell you, oh, you got to cut out red meat and take some omega-3s. Well, that doesn't solve your high insulin problem, so it's not going to cure your high triglyceride problems. So if you want to get to the source of the problem, we're going to attack insulin, and we do that with our high blood sugar quick fix kit if you want to launch. Yeah. Uh, so just to kind of reiterate what, what Stan was saying, get your tests. Uh, your, your fasting glucose is important. Um, ideally, you'd be under 100 with that. Uh, your HA1C, just to kind of explain what that is, that's your three-month average of your glucose level. So that's more towards what the physician is going to use when they're diagnosing any kind of diabetes or prediabetes because that's the level that the glucose has been at over a longer period of time. Um, but like he said, the insulin is also an important factor to take into consideration there, which a lot of times that doesn't always get brought into the conversation. Um, so with the high blood sugar uh, quick fix kit, again, 10 minute walks. So if you have a meal right now and you go for a walk, your active muscle will be able to take in glucose independent of insulin. So you don't even need insulin around and the cells can take it in and metabolize it, which will reduce the amount that's circulating in the blood. That's a good thing. So that will reduce any kind of a peak or spike in your blood. Um, and there's a lot of data to support this. So, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be a walk, but that's really simple for everybody. You know, if you want to go outside and do some sprints, same thing. If you are lifting weights, same thing. You're starting to, to be active. The muscle is going to take it in a little bit quicker. Yeah, the movement, the weightlifting is fantastic. That'll increase uh, glucose absorption for up to 24 to 48 hours. So mm -hmm. that's ideal. I did a video on this where I talked about uh, walking, 10-minute walks three times a day after meals is twice as effective as metformin, which is the number one medication that's prescribed uh, to prevent type 2 diabetes. Uh, and that that actually has been shown in research that this movement, this uh, they only recommended, uh, I think it was 130 minutes a week, and we're recommending 210 minutes with three 10-minute walks a day. Mm -hmm. The frequency seems to matter. Those people who, who do their uh, walk at the end of the day, sedentary people or people who work in a seated position, truck drivers or office workers, if they go to the gym at the end of the day for 30 minutes, it's not as effective if you do three 10-minute walks throughout the day. The frequency seems to matter. So that's a huge one for reducing blood sugars. Yeah, number two, again, lose weight. So kind of the same thing we talked about in the, the hypertension. Uh, losing weight doesn't even need to be a lot. You'll start to see a difference almost immediately. Um, improving sleep, same thing. That's going to help with your insulin sensitivity. Um, sleep is actually, if you disrupt sleep, it's been shown to start promoting muscle wasting. If you've got less lean muscle, you're going to have less ability to take in and, and uh, metabolize the glucose as efficiently because you're not going to have those cells to do so as well. Um, vitamin D, again, you know, keeping that where, where it needs to be. Um, all the electrolytes, potassium, calcium, those are all. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the big take home here is that, you know, your carbohydrate intake, we're not saying everybody needs to go low carb or keto or anything to manage this kind of stuff, but it should be appropriate. You know, so your carbohydrate intake should match your activity and your need. Um, and so I think that's where a lot of people maybe go wrong. They're not necessarily paying attention to how many carbohydrates they're taking in overall. And so they may be overdoing it a little bit, and that could be causing some issues. 
Um, iodine. Iodine. One. Yeah, important. Same as, same as hypertension yep. uh, for thyroid because that will help with glucose metabolism. I'll say this in general about dieting. A lot of times people who have high insulin, maybe they don't know. They got their blood sugar test. It was normal. It was between 80 and 100. They got their HA1C test, and it was normal. It was 5.4, 5.6. It's not in the pre-diabetic range. And so they think that, that they've got, they're fine with their blood sugars, but they've got a horrible time with um, uh, snacking. Uh, maybe they've, they've got cravings. Uh, they, what happens is, is, is if you have high insulin and you eat, carbohydrates, it's going to end up, the insulin's going to end up driving those carbohydrates down to your hypoglycemic. Then you're going to be extremely hungry, uncontrollably hungry. And the way to remedy that, other than, you know, in addition to these methods, particularly with somebody who's just starting a diet, and the biggest problem in, with compliance is that they're hungry, they're just, they're just voracious, and they want to eat a dozen donuts, or they want to, you know, have a <laughs> gallon of soda or, or Kool-Aid. Um, there's a couple things that you need to do. Um, one of the ways that diabetics manage a hypoglycemic event is they carry around dextrose tablets. And so as soon as they start to fuel, feel that, that lightheadedness, that dizziness, you know, maybe the, the vision starting to close down, they'll pop some dextrose tablets to prevent themselves from going into a, a hypoglycemic coma. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a similar feeling for those people who have high insulin. They end up just getting voraciously hungry and they can't help themselves. They'll eat a dozen donuts uh, at one sitting. You can remedy that, that hunger with just a couple of, of dextrose tablets. I make the recommendation that people carry around some Jolly Ranchers with them. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, plus, you know, in, in instances like these, when you've got high blood sugars and you're, you're um, would you say you've got uh, metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, high blood sugars in general, we start those diets out with a little reduction in carbohydrates. Yep. Uh, we're not opposed to carbohydrates in most cases, particularly for, athletic, for athletes. Uh, we think they're very beneficial for anaerobic and, and um, you know, for bodybuilding and things like that and football. But if you're having problems with cravings and hunger and you're overeating, that's the, you know, that's the, uh, the best way to lose weight is to control how much food you eat, not yep. to try and exercise it away. It's not very effective to do it that way. If you're overeating because you're over hungry, because you've got low blood sugar, because you've got high insulin, one of the ways to manage that is just simply with a little bit a lower carbohydrate diet. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you, utilizing those Jolly Ranchers. And even in between meals, we have them take in, uh, like we've been recommending some Nun tablets. It's mm -hmm. just sodium bicarbonate. It's baking soda. And that tends to suppress the acid in your stomach. You have, so you, it's not uh, driving hunger again. So we're trying to manage those, um, those hormonal signals to prevent hunger as best we can. There's medications that doctors use to, that have the same effect. They try and suppress hunger. Uh, we make those recommendations as lifestyle changes that you can implement without having to do the medications. But uh, controlling hunger is going to be huge for uh, compliance, and we know that compliance is the science, and if you want to uh, be successful in a diet, you can't be fighting hunger all the time. It's not sustainable. And so getting control of insulin with all those methods I just mentioned can be a priority. Knowing that you have that problem can help you understand uh, the, the methods that you need to implement to control that, that appetite and why. Yeah, and some other uh, things you can do with, with the food choices and, and controlling hunger and, and cravings and things like that, protein and fat, right? So very satiating. They'll make you feel full. So taking in more protein and more fat slightly, Not we're not saying to eat sticks of butter here, but um, taking in a little bit more will help you feel fuller longer, and that can help with some of those cravings too. I have to say that if you're just going to uh, eat steak and Scrambled eggs uh, as, a, as a majority of your food for, you know, at least a brief period of time, maybe take you 30 days to, to remedy these uh, blood sugar issues, get your insulin down to where you don't have the cravings. Then you can reintroduce some of the other foods that you like. And during that time, you're at least able to control the, the hunger and, and you'll have better energy levels as well. It's not that you know, any diet's going to require a calorie deficit. And that calorie deficit is going to uh, impart some sort of hunger. It's the degree of that hunger, whether or not you're hungry or hangry, that matters. And if, if you can manage a little bit of hunger, that's fine. But if you've got these high insulin levels and all of a sudden you're just voraciously hungry, uh, you're not going to be able to manage that long term. So implement all of those methods in order to control that. Yeah. So you can see this complex and everything kind of plays together. So the third thing that we want to cover today is GERD, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. A lot of people know it as, as acid reflux. Um, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, 
big picture here, the, the big part of that and reducing any kind of symptoms from that is reducing anything that's going to weaken the lower esophageal sphincter. So those are things like caffeine. Um, chocolate has caffeine in there. Uh, eating large meals because the pressure will actually build and start pushing on that. Um, so anything that's going to um, increase that pressure or weaken that, that sphincter is, is going to cause an, an increase in that. Yes. Right. It could, doesn't even have to be a large meal. It just mm-hmm. has to be what we call high FODMAP foods, those fermentable oligodiamonosaccharides and polyols, things that create gas. We talked about uh, uh, sugar alcohols are, are indigestible and they create a lot of gas and bloating and they may cause that, that acid reflux. Um, some vegetables, and depending on how they're prepared and how much of them you eat, um, could be like broccoli and mm-hmm. asparagus and cauliflower. They can cause some, some bloating and gas and gastric reflux. Uh, too much food, obviously, or even drinking too much water with the meal itself might just have too much volume such that uh, the acid uh, splashes up. The most important thing, as you mentioned, is it's really about controlling that esophageal sphincter yeah. because it's not high acid. In the vast majority of cases, when you have acid reflux, it's not because you have too much acid. You don't need antacids. You need to control that sphincter yeah. so mm-hmm. that you don't have what little acids in there splashing up. Exactly. And tell them why it's so darn important that this gets remedied uh, because of all the problems that occur as a result of taking antacids. Well, so if you're if you're disrupting your stomach acid or you're disrupting that digestive and, and you're dealing with, with GERD, it, it basically, systemically, you, you've got your gut-brain axis. It's going to basically affect everything else in your body. Um, your whole gut microbiome is going to get thrown off. Your digestion is going to get thrown off. Your sleep is going to get thrown off. Um, everything's going to get thrown off. Your immune system's going to get thrown off because your gut is your immune health. So You're not going to um, absorb protein as right. well. You're not going to absorb your minerals, your, your, your magnesium and your calcium and your iron. None of those things are going to get absorbed because you don't have the acid in your stomach to break those down and, and help them uh, transport through the rest of your body. Yeah, and you know, if you're somebody that just has severe GERD and, and you know, taking these precautions doesn't do anything, you know, other things that you can do on top of that is just not lay down right after a meal you know, elevate your head when you're laying down because the gravity will actually start to draw that up too. Um, so some that's, of these are, go take are, your walk, right? <laughs> some of this is discipline oriented. Yeah. I, I hate to keep uh, beating on that drum, but it's just like sleep, turning your phone off, you know, and turning the TV off two hours before you're supposed to go to bed and understanding when you're supposed to go to bed. Those are just personal choices that you have to be disciplined enough to make. And with eating, some of the most important things is just not to eat too fast. Not too much and not too fast. Chew your food very, very well. And we recommend eating your proteins first. Stimulates the acid production so that you can digest the food better. And then having your carbohydrates towards the end of the meal, it can be important. So those are a couple real important factors in addition to the low FODMAP menu. And then there, it does seem to be some help for those people who um, underproduce the stomach acid As you age, you tend to produce less stomach acid. And if you have a lower protein diet, then you're going to produce less stomach acid. This happens a lot with our our vegetarian and vegan clients. They don't produce as much acid. And so you have to introduce a supplement. Mm -hmm. Uh, Betaine HCL pepsin is a supplement that's quite commonly used and is very effective. Uh, And it's not something you necessarily have to take forever until you maybe get your body learning uh, to to produce as much acid as it needs. You just take one... uh, Kind of the, 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 mecha, the method that we use is mm. you take one before a meal and then you eat the meal and, and see how you feel, see if it works. You might even take one and then wait 15 minutes and see if you have any acid feeling. And uh, then each meal thereafter, you could add an additional dose of betaine HCL pepsin. So you go to taking two. And if you don't feel any acid, any burning sensation, then maybe you can go to taking three until you get to the point where you take enough till you feel a burning sensation, then you've gone too far, so you back off one. And that might be your initial dose. Maybe you get work up to having to take three or four or five before each meal in order to digest that meal effectively and not have gastric reflux. And then over time, you could reduce that from five to four, from four to three, and hopefully after the end of 30 days or so, you can have yeah. eliminated it. Because we're trying to get for the lowest effective dose. You know, yes. you don't want to be taking you know, a bunch of that for a long period of time. That's not good either. What we're trying to do is, is figure out what's an effective dose and then kind of titrate off that. So Yeah. And the goal, obviously, you know, we don't, even the supplements, we'd like you to get you off of. But the, uh, those medications for gastric reflux were never intended to be long-term. We've had clients come to us who have been on those medications, uh, prescription medications, for six or seven years. Yeah. Uh, or popping, um, you know, the over-the-counter, the Tums and, and what have you. Uh, pretty commonly with each meal. And that, uh, again, that's going to cause all kinds of problems in terms of your ability to absorb and utilize the nutrients that you eat. 
Uh, it, oftentimes, as I've seen this many, many times, and I think it's in the literature as well, uh, people get started on these acid reflux medications, and next thing you know, they're taking antidepressants because they're having problems with uh, stress and depression. Yeah. So all of this is systemic. I mean, everything in your body is going to go back to basically your gut and, and your gut health. So that's why our diet is, is so, you know, focused on those things and, and, and fixing or optimizing as much as you can. Yeah. Well, those were the three most commonly asked questions this week. Keep shooting me your questions. You can DM them to at Stan Efforting uh, or email me stanefforting at yahoo.com if you'd like. Uh, those are probably the easiest ways. Uh, L and a reminder for the vertical diet, uh, we're recording this in uh, the midst of the coronavirus yes. and uh, we try and avoid making any comments about that. We're referring to the CDC uh, for any actions that you should take with regard to that. But if you're having trouble getting food, which I stood in the Costco line for an hour the other day and they were still out of toilet paper when I got up to the front, um, my solution's the shower uh, massager. <laughs> that, that works pretty good when you don't have, when you don't have, we don't shake hands anymore right. because you never know. <laughs> Somebody ran out of toilet paper, they had to do what they had to do. Uh, but the Vertical Diet has uh, meal prep and we uh, definitely have uh, plenty in stock. Uh, we're working hard. We also got the lowest cost per calorie of any meal prep on the market. We've got the world's strongest Monster Mash. It's 685 calories for under $7 delivered free to your door. We sell them in pairs, so you'll see world's strongest Monster Mash. Uh, it's $13.95. That's two uh, containers for $13.95, 1,370 calories. And we'll ship it to your door free of charge. Uh, and we've got uh, we've had a huge week this week with yep. orders, and we fulfilled every single one. We brought in an extra shift, so we're here for you if you need that stuff. And we're giving away three free, free meals for every sixteen that are ordered. So that's about it for this week. Yep. And we'll see you again next week with more questions. <laughs>